Hello, my name is Rebecca Shah, and uh, welcome to the panel discussion on proselytism, poverty, and development practice in today's world, which is part of today's public dialogue on sharing the message, proselytism and development in pluralistic societies. If anyone had any doubt, really, that these issues are incredibly important and also incredibly relevant and controversial, they need only read the newspaper from my part of the world and Ahsoka's part of the world. First, uh, since the election of Modi, Narendra Modi, uh, last year, there has been growing furor about Hindu nationalist groups proselytizing and promoting so-called reconversions among poor Muslims and Christians. This is so-called reconversion to Hinduism from uh, Islam and Christianity. Second, last week, I, you may have heard this, he mentioned this in the previous panel, the chief of the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, the RSS, which is the pillar of the Hindu nationalist movement in India, the trunk from which the ruling BJP party grew as a branch, took a swipe at Mother Teresa of all people. He said, and I quote, there was a motive behind Mother Teresa's social services that those who, who are rendered the service should become Christian. Third, a tumultuous debate has been opened up by Bhagat's comments. Uh, a couple of days ago, Archbishop of Delhi, the Roman Catholic Archbishop of Delhi, Anil Kuto, re said recently, her main aim was to affirm the dignity of every human being as a child of God, who reflects God's image, of course, according to the teachings of Lord Jesus Christ. Missionary activity will always proclaim the life-giving message of Jesus Christ in word and deed. These examples could be multiplied, but these suffice to dramatize the issues we will be discussing in the panel. The relationship in India and many parts, other parts of the world between religious proselytize religious proselytism and development is sharply contested, particularly in context of religious pluralism. On the one hand, an international covenants and many national constitutions recognize that religious freedom includes rights to personal religious conversion and public religious witness. As I mentioned in the previous panel, an example is the Indian Constitution, Article 25. All persons are equally entitled to freedom of conscience and the right to profess, practice, and propagate religion. Note the word propagate. But critics claim that proselytism can violate the rights of affected communities to maintain their traditions and can sow division in fragile societies. They also claim, just as Bhagat claimed about Mother Teresa, that the combination of development with and an international, intentional religious witness subtly manipulates the poor and vulnerable to receive and adopt a religious message in exchange for material help. These are very tough issues, but thankfully we have an excellent panel who will help us navigate and explore them in all their depth and complexity. <coughs> and I'm very grateful for this panel because as you've heard, uh, not just from the previous panel, but also if you've read about this issue, this is a very complex and uh, I would say difficult topic to discuss. And I'm very grateful to, to the panel here. Uh, they're all brilliant people and might I say also a bit crazy to participate in something that can be, uh, I can incite some of strong passion. I, you all have, as bios in front of you and to maximize time for discussion, I will not offer lengthy introductions. Uh, on, my, on my left here, I'll, I'll introduce the panelists very briefly and if you want to know more about them, I think their bios are on the web or in the booklet in front of you. On my left is uh, Professor Asoka Bandarage. She is a member of the steering committee of Interfaith Moral Action on Climate. She has addressed the UN General Assembly and led many national and international forums on such concerns as the transforming crisis of 9-11 and the 2004 Asian tsunami and the peace process in Sri Lanka. In addition, she has authored numerous articles and books, 
including sustainability and well-being, the middle path to environment, society, and economy, and writes a column for the Huffington Post. Thank you for being here, Ahsoka. Next to Ahsoka uh, is Kent Hill. Kent Hill, uh, Dr. Kent Hill, is, a, is the Senior Vice President of International Programs for World Vision United States. World Vision, as some of you may know, is a Christian humanitarian organization that supports children and their families by addressing the causes of poverty and injustice. An expert on democracy, international development policy, and religious freedom issues, he has extensive experience with multiple US government departments and agencies, assistance uh, uh, from other countries, and hundreds of US and international NGOs, including faith-based organizations. Kent worked with USAID, and he served as the Assistant Administrator of Europe and Eurasia from 2001 to 2005. He has a PhD in, in, in uh, history, both from the uh, an MA in Russian studies, both from the University of Washington. Thank you, Kent. Finally, but not last but not but least, is Catherine Marshall. Catherine Marshall is a senior fellow at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs, where she leads the centers, one of the centers, most, one of the most important programs at the center on religion and global development. After a long career in the development field, including several leadership positions at the World Bank, Catherine moved to Georgetown in 2006, where she also serves as a visiting professor in the School of Foreign Service. She helped to create and now serves as the executive director of the World Faiths and De Development Dialogue. Thank you, Catherine. I think we're going to start, I'm going to start off with you, Catherine, if you, if you don't mind, because as we've seen from your bio, you've been actively engaging this issue of uh, faith and development for a very long time. And I want to ask you, Catherine, based on your work with the World Faiths Development Dialogue, which was established in 2000, by the former World Bank President James Wilfinson, who you worked with very closely and which you led for many years. And uh, the program, the World Faith Development Dialogue, of course, seeks to highlight the positive achievement and potential of religion in promoting economic development. However, uh, I wonder if I'm right in saying that in this journey, as it were, working with faith and development, you've encountered some skepticism about the, quote, faith factor in development. And some of it has clearly been driven by a worry about proselytism. How much of this skepticism among secular development agencies and experts has to do with proselytism? And how much, Catherine, of it, it is justified? Could you just talk from your experience? Let me start with uh, coming at the proselytism issue through three sets of experience uh, that we've had. The first was that when Jim Wolfenson launched uh, a dialogue process, and I say dialogue, uh, with uh, a variety of, of faith actors in 1998 with the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, they had, he was excited and this was seemed a positive opening to a constituency that had been strikingly absent from a lot of the development discourse. Uh, and he ran into, we ran into very unexpected uh, controversy on the topic. And to a large extent, that remains. The sense that religion and development uh, in the international sphere and in many bilateral contexts is, um, is an inappropriate mix. So we spent a lot of time back then uh, exploring essentially what what was behind this concern and skepticism. And one of the issues was clearly the sense, and this did not come out as much in the earlier panel, uh, that a lot about religion is really about politics, mm -hmm. that it is political, uh, and that the issues of proselytizing come down to questions around motive. Uh, they also come around down to vi visions of different visions of what development means, what the path is, et cetera. Uh, and there are, there are particular concerns when public funding mm -hmm. is uh, at issue and the question of, mm -hmm. of appropriate legal distinctions uh, between church, mosque, and state, et cetera. 
But just as an illustration, um, and it's something that, again, did not come up in the earlier panel, but the, the first words out of many people's mouths are Hezbollah and Muslim Brotherhood mm -hmm. and Hamas. In other words, there is this question, set of questions, as to whether the services to the poor that are provided in these contexts, but equally mm -hmm. in a number of Christian contexts, are as altruistic mm -hmm. uh, as they appear. And that basically religion has an enormous amount to do with mm -hmm. politics. So that was sort of the first, uh, first set of, of experiences. The second is that we undertook an, a, a, a survey, um, which was really its last at about eight years, uh, with the Berkeley Center uh, and in cooperation with the World Faiths Development Dialogue, where we've looked at six different regions of the world and 10 or 12 development issues ranging from corruption to malaria to housing to energy access, essentially virtually all of the Millennium Development Goals. And Rather to our surprise, um, there are several issues that came up in every single one of our consultation processes. And you can see these expressed in different ways in many of the interviews. We have about 300 interviews that have been part of this process on the Berkeley Center website. Uh, the issue of proselytism came up again and again. Uh, just to make sure we mention it at least, another issue that came up everywhere was the treatment of women. Mm -hmm and a broader sense of gender issues, with the assumption that religious organizations, to put it in a simplistic way, don't mm -hmm. get it in mm -hmm. terms of uh, gender equality. Uh, so th those are two. There are a number of other issues. But proselytizing was a concern, a nagging concern. And so I'm absolutely delighted that after many years of mm -hmm. trying to see how we might move towards a more constructive discussion, of this complex topic we're, we're talking about it today. And the third set of experiences that it is that in a few countries where I've been very directly involved, and I'll cite particularly Cambodia and Morocco, mm -hmm. I've had the chance to go a little bit deeper into what is behind this almost allergic reaction, this sense of, of, the, of the limits of proselytizing. So in answer to your question, um, Perceptions matter, mm -hmm. we all know that, um, and so do realities. And I think we don't know enough about what really happens, but we have enough anecdotes and enough evidence from people who have lived experience uh, that there are um, perceptions of, of lines being crossed, uh, and uh, there are uh, egregious cases, but there are also enormous complexities as to where, the draw the, where to draw the line. And I would myself distinguish humanitarian relief, which is largely, in my understanding of the definitions of humanitarian, related to emergency situations and the relief of misery, as Michael Barnett has said, uh, from development, which is almost indefinable in the current world because it involves everything, it involves every issue. And whereas in the humanitarian arena, there have been quite extensive discussions mm -hmm. of the limits and the definition of neutrality, and there are quite clear understandings of where the limits are, in the development field, that is much less true. Mm -hmm. uh, and because it involves education, it involves health, it involves social protection, uh, and it involves orphanages. It involves a number of issues where the, uh, the model of development <coughs> that is being advocated matters. Uh, it is much more complex. And the fact that an institution like the World Bank has almost never discussed these issues in terms of religious freedom or in terms of the, the constructive role of religion in development, I think points to the fact that there is the need for this kind of discussion. Thank you, Catherine. I, I, um, I can you hear me? Yes. Well, uh, you mentioned a very important point, uh, one, a very important issue, which was the treatment of women, and you, you weren't. And I, 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 I want to hold on to that, hold that, because I have a, a good question for Kent and for yourself and you, Asoka, on that, about on the destabilizing 
uh, effect, the positive effect, the destabilizing effect that proselytism can have, say, on, on a culture. So we'll hold that for a minute. And I, uh, I want to ask you, Kent, just to, to follow on from what Catherine said. Um, you, you are head of international relations at World Vision. It's one of the largest uh, Christian uh, uh, relief and development organizations in the world. And she said there was a concern that many uh, large faith-based development organizations like World Vision have uh, then, I mean, one of the concerns was proselytization. And, and, and there may be, at least it's a perception, and you talked about perception, that these Christian organizations, these religious organizations, have a hidden motive or agenda. In your experience, uh, how widespread is that concern? I mean, I'm, I'm going to bring in Sri Lanka here again, because we have Ahsoka sitting to my left. In the wake of the tsunami, there was a lot of concern that the religious organizations which were there in Sri Lanka working to provide relief for the, the many people displaced by this terrible tsunami were actually there with a hidden agenda, which wasn't, wasn't really hidden. I mean, there were cases where a lot of, I think it was a contingent from Texas, I think it was, that, were, that um, caused a lot of, uh, uh, was written up in the press about proselytizing, and they had an agenda to convert the the victims of the tsunami. So, how widespread is this is this concern, and how do you respond to it if you hear it being articulated? It's uh, it's probably very difficult to generalize about all faith based groups who are involved in humanitarian work or even transformational development work beyond HEA. Uh, I'm absolutely sure there there are examples. Of, of folks who have used emergency situations or humanitarian assistance and their primary goal is to see souls saved mm -hmm. or something like that. I'm sure that's true. It's not been my experience that that's the, the common uh, situation, that most, uh, I'll speak about the Christian FBOs, I know a little bit more about them. It's not been my experience that that's been the main motive for the vast majority of them. In fact, um, in 1994, when the uh, Red Cross, Co uh, Cross Code came out and the, the Red Crescent and the NGOs of the world got together and they set up clear rules, they explicitly you know, denounced that sort of thing. And the last count I saw was the 546 uh, organizations uh, signed that accord saying what's appropriate, what is not appropriate, and many of those are, are faith-based groups. Um, that is also the position of the World Council of Churches and the uh, Evangelical World Alliance and the Catholic Church when they came to their agreement in 2011 about how to do work in multi-religious settings. They also completely ruled out uh, those kinds of inappropriate uses of uh, development assistance. I read last night one of the last documents of Vatican II in 1965 was an explicit rejection of coercive use of assistance in the name of spreading the faith. So I think there's a, a really quite a strong consensus that that is not appropriate. Does it ever happen? I'm sure it does. Mm -hmm. Does it happen very often? It's not been my experience that it does. Let me tell you what I think is the more serious problem for faith-based organizations. Um, you know, I, I spent nine years as a college president, evangelical uh, college president. And I had done a study of Catholic and uh, Protestant uh, institutions of higher education. Um, and I had earlier worked in the, the sort of mainline and evangelical Protestant world. And I used to teach history of Christianity. And the rule that I have come to really adopt is, or the principle I've come to see is, that whether you're talking about a Christian individual, a Christian NGO, a church, the drift away from mission is always the most serious problem you face. So for example, most Catholic and uh, Protestant uh, higher education institutions are no longer what they once were in terms of their commitment. This is true for Christian NGOs. The biggest debate at World Vision is making sure that we don't drift away from being indistinguishable from another uh, NGO who, who doesn't uh, have any religious motivation for their compassion, who doesn't think seriously about what would it mean to programmatically reflect your belief in the gospel, the radical love of, of, of God, uh, our biggest debates are about that, mm -hmm. not about that occasional coloring outside the line. So there's a lot of discussion about it. 
tends to center on this question. What is appropriate witness to your faith mm -hmm. as a humanitarian worker? And the answers to that question run the full gamut. Um, I've talked too long now, but at some point, I think we do need to talk about the difference between proselytism with its usually negative um, understanding and what most would prefer to talk about is witness in some sense to what you believe. That's an excellent point because I think we're going to bring this up and I'll use the example from the Samaritan's Purse website and what sort of is an intentional <coughs> witness. I mean, they go out there and they do relief work mm -hmm. and it's on their website on, in the site about us. And, when, when, and it, it says that when they are asked, why are you here? They say, we are here because we are motivated by Jesus Christ. So whilst they go there and do their work, they clearly, there is clearly a, a sort of a, a witness. So we can talk about that, but uh, thank you. So we've got, to, we've got two issues, two key issues to bring up in the, in the next round of questioning, which I'm excited about. This is flowing well. Asoka, tell us a little bit about Sri Lanka. We have, there are concerns, of course, in Sri Lanka, as there are in India, that proselytizing religions like Christianity and Islam disrupt uh, local belief systems and in many, way, in many ways try to induce people <coughs> to convert. You've done work in this area. Uh, how does the presence of, of a faith-based organization, World Vision or otherwise, influence conversion in, in countries like your native Sri Lanka? Yeah, uh, well, thank you for this opportunity to um, you know, make a few remarks. But before I answer your specific question, I want to put this issue in a broader framework, on the broader context of what is really happening in the world today. Uh, we see the rise of uh, religious extremism of all uh, stripes uh, in horrific violence, and I don't need to you know, specify, we all know what is happening, and the, the depth of ethno-religious conflict on the one hand, and also environmental collapse, uh, climate change, etc., where the very survival of humanity and the planet uh, is at stake. So it seems that in this context, and this is, you know, there's plenty of evidence for all that, uh, we need an ethic that is global, that brings people together, despite our differences. And I think if we are really talking about proselytizing, we should be proselytizing for a global ethic, a universal ethic, which are really uh, emphasizes the equality of all uh, people and uh, the unity despite the diversity because the unity is stronger and it has to become stronger in order for us to have sustainable development and a viable world because we are at that kind of a critical stage at this point in time. And I say this because of you know my own experience working with the interfaith uh, uh, coalition on uh, Interfaith Moral Action on Climate, the recent uh, book I have written, etc. So I just feel very strongly that I need to preface that before I get into the specifics of uh, today's discussion. And if I may put a plug for this most recent blog I wrote for Huffington Post, Proselytism or a Global Ethic, which was just published last night, uh, you know, please uh, uh, look at that as well. So to, uh, going to Sri Lanka, how do faith-based organizations influence conversion? Again, you know, we have to look at the situation in any particular uh, region or country in terms of uh, the broader political and economic realities of uh, uh, widening inequality, uh, deepening poverty, and also more and more frequent was tsunamis, floods, and disaster situations, uh, you know, partly uh, as a result of uh, the kind of environmental and social collapse that we are experiencing on a global scale. So yes, there is a great need on the part of people for aid 
for material support, for health care, for food, for housing, education, jobs. And when it comes, it is greatly appreciated, particularly, say, in a context like the tsunami. And why is it that there is a dependence on external uh, groups, development uh, organizations, including faith-based groups? And that's also partly because of the kind of international policies that have been in place, particularly since the 1970s and the privatization of state uh, social services, uh, when in places like Sri Lanka, the state sort of began to move away from the provision of uh, uh, basic social services, and uh, many NGOs came in to fill that vacuum, and that included a lot of uh, faith-based organizations that came from the outside. And increasingly, uh, faith-based organizations uh, uh, and their work both in development and diplomacy have become part of uh, a policy of uh, donor governments, particularly the United States, if you look at the faith-based uh, initiative that is promoted by uh, USAID and uh, the State Department. So the use of aid uh, in uh, the context of uh, humanitarian and uh, development support does create a lot of conflict. Uh, as you know, we, we have all uh, referred to. In Sri Lanka, there are said to be over 1,000 faith-based organizations uh, active in uh, humanitarian and development work. And, it, and it's, the focus is on the most vulnerable groups, mm -hmm. uh, particularly uh, children and youth. So they may not be the ones who are in a position to really make informed uh, choice uh, deci decisions and as it was pointed out in the last panel, you know, people in very vulnerable situations, like say in the context of a tsunami, are not able to make those kinds of uh, decisions. Plus, uh, religious conversion, you know, is not something uh, a decision that you know one can make overnight. It should be a gradual process of opening to a different way of thinking and gradually moving in a different direction, which I think should be available to uh, all people. The, the right to uh, change a religion, but the right to also maintain and have a religion is also a fundamental uh, human right. Mm -hmm. And it is upheld in the International uh, Covenant on uh, Civil and Political Rights. So when we are talking about the right to conversion, we must not forget the right to maintain and have a religion as well. And these can come in conflict with each other. So I think you know, that's why it's important to, to look at the many dimensions of this issue. This is a, sorry, this mm -hmm. is a brilliant time, I think, for, to bring Catherine in. I know I have a question on, uh, you know, on, on core development concerns and what good proselytism can do. But I'm going to ask you, Catherine, just to respond to this, because I think it will be good for you to, you just mentioned, I just asked you a question, and you talked about your so the struggle you had at the bank, and Ashoka here has mentioned this global ethic that needs to pervade our, our, our society and her work with interfaith. But you had trouble for years, I'm going to say decades, trying to bring in uh, a sort of a consensus with faith-based faith organizations, religious actors, and development. And as you said, the key issue that kept coming up, apart from the issue and other issues, was, was proselytism. And how does one get over this? How does one get around this? How does, I mean, this is going to come up. I mean, tomorrow when we talk about other issues, people are going to say, ah, but all this organization really wants to do is proselytize. We won't let them go here. So how does one, I mean, you were at the bank, you've worked at this, we, you've done projects, I mean, setting this up. How does one do this? Well, let me start by emphasizing that, to my mind, these issues matter. Yes. Um, they matter some of the numbers that were mentioned this morning. We're talking about enormous complex worlds uh, in, this, in this question about engaging religious actors, institutions, beliefs, ideas, mm -hmm. and so forth in, in development, which is also an enormously uh, complex and varied field. And it does vary by country. Mm -hmm. So every country, it's contextual, as we say. But there's one area where I think it matters particularly, and that is in something that is a focus now, which is the fragile 
and conflict states, <coughs> which might be somewhere between 35 and 40 countries, depending on your definition. Uh, and in every single one of these fragile state situations, clearly religion matters. But if you look at the literature on fragile states, it's very rare to see a real engagement uh, with, with it, except generally in a stereotyped negative way associated with violent extremism. So in order to move the conversation forward about the religious engagement in this very difficult, complex group mm -hmm. of countries, I think we need to have the adult conversation about the complexities of religion. And that does include the varied motivations and practices, including in some of the difficult areas, which include vulnerable children and so forth. So, so I think that it, the idea, the, the lack of an appreciation of some of the complexities of how the faith-inspired organizations operate, what their origins are, uh, et cetera, uh, is, is a very uh, important gap in, in the discussion. So Kent, I mean, how does, I'm, I'm just gonna ask you, how does one respond to that? I mean, uh, the, there is certainly this risk that groups, faith-based groups might proselytize and therefore destabilize an already mm -hmm. vulnerable, fragile situation. How do you respond to that? I mean, not just from your experience at USAID, but also as someone who's been in this field for, for a long time. I think Asoka is right. The, the threat of religious extremism, and that can come from many different quarters, is one of the most uh, difficult challenges in these fragile states. Catherine was right, too, to talk about that. Um, I've asked myself the question, how do you fight religious extremism? And there's a couple of views on this. One view, if you're a, a sort of a skeptical, secular person, you say just another sign of the harm that religion does in the world. If you're a religious person, and I don't mean just a Christian, but a, a Muslim, let's say, as well, you might very well have a very different perspective on this. You might look at this religious extremism as an absolute betrayal of your religious convictions and what you believe about God. And, and uh, you, you, are, you are particularly angry for them hijacking your religion, whether it's Christianity or Islam or whatever. And I've often thought, you know, the best answer to religious extremism isn't the secular response which says we ought to just not have any religion. The best answer to religious extremism is intelligent religion that's compassionate and moderate. And that doesn't mean that you don't have convictions. Let's take the Christian uh, perspective on this for a second. It's Christian theology that would require us to do precisely what Ahsoka was talking about when she said we've got to find a way to find common ground with those who differ from us. Not just share our views and hope that everybody thinks like we do, but to find that common human ground. Now, Christians are obligated, it seems to me, mm -hmm. to seek that common ground. They're, they have a theological warrant to seek that common ground because our view that all people are created in the image of God. That's other Christians, that's other religions, that is people of no religion. Mm -hmm. We are most Christian when we affirm that common, mm -hmm. that common human dignity. So I think the antidote to bad religion is good religion. Mm -hmm. And often, good religion, which is born out of, of uh, cooperation with other religious groups who together can, from within their traditions, find a way to bring parties together who are at, at, each, other's, uh, at each other's throat. So when you see this problem in the world, We've got to figure out a way, how do we bring the best of our religions to be a healing balm to, and to work with others to, to, accomplish, to accomplish that mission? I'll let you respond. Oh. Catherine, Catherine just wants to step I in for a minute. Just one footnote. Um, in the question about destabilizing, I think one important point to make is that it is religious people who are often the ones who see the activities of insensitive development people who proselytize as the biggest danger mm -hmm. and as something that, first of all, makes it more difficult for the faith-inspired groups to work Absolutely. in a given situation. And I think they are genuinely concerned that the blunderbuss approach, to put it crudely, uh, where someone comes in with a very strong view of what is uh, what they need to do to change a given society can be very destructive to to the society 
and, for example, encourage the growth of extremist mm -hmm. uh, reactions. So they, it is the religious people, no not doubt. only the secularists, who raise these concerns. Thank mm -hmm. you. You can please, res would you like to respond to uh, Kent? Yeah, I think that uh, this mix of religion and aid is a dangerous mix. Uh, both are needed. People need religion. People have had religion from you know the beginning of time. Uh, more and more people need aid, and neither should be denied. But when they come together, you know, it becomes a very dangerous, sometimes a, a, a lethal situation. So I guess that's sort of at the crux of our discussion. You know, how how can you have both uh, without them sort of uh, being identified with each other? And that, I think, is where you know, uh, international norms and great responsibility on the part of uh, donor governments and uh, uh, codes of conduct, et cetera, which you know, we can perhaps discuss in greater detail, uh, need to come into play. But also real concern for peace and stability. And uh, I think that's where re real religious practice should come in, in terms of uh, uh, compassion right. and respect and tolerance uh, for diversity. Just one more thing on the fragile states is that I listened to that excellent talk, speech by President, the current President, uh, President Kim at the World Bank, and what he was saying too was what often feeds a lot of these st this, this, the unrest is the lack of work and the lack of employment. And as you said, Kent, uh, a lot of uh, as Christians, people have, uh, you have, Christian religious organizations have an imperative to go out there and, uh, and work for everyone. Uh, just a plug for Bob, Brian Grimm's work. Of course, Brian Grimm, who's, a, 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 who's got his own foundation, but who's an associate scholar of the Religious Freedom Project, does this precisely this. He works with people from all faiths to, to encourage businesses, the private sector, to come in and provide uh, invest in, in, in difficult situations. And I remember uh, a talk that Rick Warren, who's here, gave a while ago where he said you need three stools, the three legs of a stool, the government, the private sector, and religious organizations to keep a country stable. Well, but On that point, though, I think this whole discussion of fragile states illustrates one of the, uh, the key misses we make in analyzing these situations. Uh, there, there's almost this underlying assumption that if only we can bring enough money to the table in these fragile states and, uh, and dig the boreholes and provide the vaccinations and provide the food that's missing, et cetera, uh, everything is going to get better. And anybody who looks at the fragile states knows that the root causes of the conflicts in those places are the real problem. They're going to keep these areas continually impoverished. And it's here that I think a good religious communities, humanitarian organizations, and not just Christian ones, but other ones as well, have something to offer. Because they have something to say to problems mm -hmm. that are humanly caused and not caused by famines or, or earthquakes and things like that. You have to put your mind to the human problem of greed and sin and conflict and and say, what can religion bring to the table in discussing, or vengeance, the desire for revenge? What can religious communities bring to the table that will attack those root causes? If those players are not involved asking those kinds of questions, you're never going to really make the kind of progress you want to make uh, to solve the root problems of the poor and the rich as well. I think we're going to move on to the next issue. Uh, this is, please bear in mind that we were trying to get a uh, good amount of question time in, unlike the previous panel. Um, we, we know that there are, the connections between proselytism and development are complicated. Hopefully getting less complicated, otherwise I'm not, we're not doing a good job. But it's sometimes the only way to promote holistic development is to alter basic beliefs, including religious beliefs that are central to people's culture and practices. Um, then I ask you, and I'm putting this to the whole panel, and I'll start with you, Catherine. Doesn't a kind of proselytism become necessary to advance core development objectives? I'm thinking here of 
issues such as gender equality, which you mentioned in your introductory remarks, child marriage, HIV AIDS awareness, maternal health, female genital mutilation. Uh, don't we need a kind of a proselytism to, to shake things up, to, break, to, to, change, to change the culture, to advance core development objectives? Yes. Uh, good. We're but uh, but I, 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 there is a, a view that human rights are the religion of the United Nations. Uh, and I'm concerned personally by what I see as some backlash uh, in various quarters, including various religious quarters, against the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and a number of the uh, covenants and so forth. Uh, that have followed from it. Uh, I, but in my view, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the evolution that's taken place over the past 60 years does come close to what Ahsoka is talking about as a global ethic, mm -hmm. uh, as does some of the principles that are laid out by, by Hans Kuhn. In other words, uh, there is a change, there is an evolution, and we should never forget that modernization development, whatever you want to call it, is profoundly disruptive of traditional societies. Uh, now, the question of how you deal with traditional views on some of these basic issues, and to me, there's nothing as central as gender relations, because it affects every human being every day of their lives. Uh, and the meaning of equality between men and women is profoundly different from many of the uh, traditions of many of the world's religions and cultures. So it is profoundly disrupted. Uh, so the question then becomes, how do you engage when you have disagreements uh, about these issues? And the LGBT issue clearly now has become something of a lightning rod. But I want to emphasize that the basic rights of women affects half the world's population. And it is as much in question and at issue uh, now uh, as it has ever been, in, is, is, is one sense. So the, the, the question that you're asking is, I think, is there, in fact, something approaching a global consensus? And we all know the questions that surround the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is 1948. Uh, the Western power, the dominance, uh, possibly um, the insensitivity to other cultures, but it's the best we've got. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that it, uh, to not to take it as an anchor mm -hmm. in these discussions uh, would be a mistake. So what I was also suggesting, and, and yes, what, uh, th what you said is very helpful, is sometimes you a kind of a proselytization, proselytism, uh, say, by religious groups going into a particular culture and saying, you know, the, the, the current culture for women is not right. It needs to be changed. And my own work in India with Dalits and the caste system, uh, you, you realize that the reasons, one of the main reasons, I'm going to say, that people are drawn uh, to the <coughs> Christian faith was, in a sense, it was a relief from the bondage of of being an outcast for centuries with no hope of ever getting out of it. And they see a sort of a radical departure in a sense of who they are. So I'm, I'm, what, my, my, and, and what, I'm, I'm gonna, what I'm asking is, is a kind of a proselytism where we alter these beliefs, these, these, these cultural traditions, a good thing? And uh, you know, we have, you, you've, you've done a lot of work on female gentle mutilation, and that, again, we, we've had people from various faith traditions go in and say, this is, is not right, and, uh, and well, question let's, that. Let's also not forget the, the point that I made earlier, that we're dealing both with perceptions and realities. Mm -hmm. And at the same time that a lot of the secular development actors, United Nations, bilateral, mm -hmm. multilateral, large NGOs, and businesses, when you ask them about religion, their reaction is they're political and they are Correct. aiming to proselytize. They would also say they do not believe in equality, full equality between men and women in the modern sense. Uh, and 
that's obviously a very complicated matter because it varies enormously. But if we're looking at blanket mm -hmm. perceptions, uh, you, you're not going to find very many development people who think that religious organizations are on the cutting edge Correct. of gender relations, uh, whether it's fighting domestic violence or um, really combating uh, uh, female cutting or, or having a global alliance against uh, child marriage. Uh, nor, and this is a, a particular hobby horse of mine, do you see uh, religious leaders and institutions and religious actors at the cutting edge of another one of the big hot button issues, which is fighting corruption. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are various reasons for that, but it's where you would expect to see the ethical, moral voice loud and clear. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, if you are part of international meetings and discourse about corruption, it's unusual to see uh, the had to see a prominent voice for religious actors. Mm -hmm. Kent, would you, would you like to respond about uh, um, proselytism? Yeah, I guess I'm a little surprised on the last comment because, at least for World Vision, it's such a huge part of our work uh, are the issues that, uh, that she's talked about. Although I, I think we should do more on corruption than, than I think we do. We don't do as much on civil society except in a, a pro program called uh, Citizen's Voice. And for us, all of the issues she talks about are, are critical. I just want to make two quick points about this. I think Christians and non-Christian religious people first need to acknowledge that we don't have a lock on compassion. Mm -hmm. uh, the other secular NGOs are just as concerned about a lot of these cultural issues as we are, and we can join hands with them and should. And again, I think from a theological perspective, that makes perfect sense to me if you really believe that the instinct for good or conscience that is in everybody, whether they think they believe in God or not, uh, it makes sense that there are people you can talk to if they're of, of, of goodwill. Secondly, when you try to address these difficult issues of early marriage or, uh, or cutting, et cetera, what we've had to do is what other NGOs have had to do is you need to go in, you have to talk with the cultural and religious leaders, you have to make your best case as sensitively as you can, and we've discovered you can make progress. You can make progress. You don't go right in and hit them over the head and say you're, you know, you're awful people. You explain why this is not good for the girls. You explain what, what you, you explain that a girl who's 15 and gets pregnant is going to have a much more difficult time. Well, these people care about their daughters. Once you explain to them, you can often, you can often make progress. So I, I think. I, I really honestly think that if you think this through, you can make all sorts of progress on cultural things that need to change, mm -hmm. that both religious and cultural actors know need to change to make the kind of improvements that we need to see happen. Yeah, um, very large questions. You know, the whole development paradigm is being questioned. Um, and that uh, is not necessarily being accepted by all in terms of uh, its impact on um, social inequality, uh, environment, uh, and even uh, diversity. So that, that needs to be prefaced. In terms of the gender issue, again, I think it has to be contextual. We need to not simply look at the complexity of aid organizations or faith-based organizations coming from the outside, but also the complexity and depth of the uh, recipient countries. Uh, many of them are, have you know, cultures and traditions that are thousands of years old, mm -hmm. and they're not all necessarily patriarchal cultures. If, for example, if you look at the Buddhist cultures, you know, the, uh, there's the inequality of uh, men and women. It may not always take the same form as what we uh, expect in the West. So I think that there's got to be greater sensitivity that you know, one doesn't bring sort of Western notions of uh, rights or equality to diverse settings. Um, but having said that, you know, I do recognize that there are certain basic fundamental human rights uh, that needs to be uh, mm -hmm. supported around the world, and it is best to do that in a secular way rather than via relig religious organizations or 
getting states involved. And the moment you get state involvement, whether it is the local state or whether it is the state of the donor uh, countries, you know, it leads to a lot more complexity, uh, particularly when uh, there is this relationship between religion, aid, and uh, diplomacy and development programs of, uh, of a uh, country like the United States. Do you want to respond to how say he's scribbling to me? But, well, but it's not, but it's, you see, the point is, though, with the religious community, it's often a religious argument that will make the most uh, progress. And if you can find within their culture, or uh, if you can make an argument for progress, what we might consider progress, and you can do it from within their context, that's always, you never want to lose that opportunity. So, for example, in the HIV crisis, when there was a lot of prejudice mm -hmm. in Christian circles against people with HIV AIDS, World Vision ran a whole series of programs called Channels of Hope, in which we brought pastors together. We actually did this with Muslim imams as well, in which we brought the religious tradition and the sacred texts of that to show how their intolerance and their lack of charity was actually in conflict with their own beliefs. That was a far more effective way to change their behavior than to give, for that group, a secular argument. So if we use religion right, it can be a tremendous force for good. It's all a question of how it's used. And on that note, uh, I'm going to ask Nick if he's around. How long do we have for questions, Nick? I think that's a good time. I think we'll make up for the previous panel. So. Uh, <laughs> I'm mentioning that because I wanted to answer many more questions. Um, so I think we have uh, Olivia. Thank you, Olivia, there. And uh, Cynthia wandering around. So please feel free to. Uh, I saw a New Yorker cartoon recently, and it <coughs> said something like, now we have a time for a 10-minute com comment disguised as a question. So perhaps <laughs> we ought not to follow uh, the New Yorker cartoon and, and ask our illustrious panel some questions I'm dying to ask, I'm sure. So, Bob Woodbury. Um, I'm just curious, you talked about various types of changes that you think would be important, like gender attitudes or global ethic or various things like that. Um, <clears throat> but all of those seem to involve changes in belief and behavior and identity, which could be viewed as proselytism. Are those things that should be banned from fragile states or from contexts of disaster relief work? Uh, and then the second question is um, related to sort of international meetings on corruption or gender um, and things like that. And um, how much is the lack of religious groups involved in that is based on how, who decides who comes rather than what people are doing on the ground? Because certainly in my work on the history of the mission movement, um, movements against corruption, movements against female genital mutilation, uh, against early marriage, they were doing those in the early 19th mm -hmm. and mid 19th century um, and we're doing them quite regularly. Um, and I presume they're still doing them, um, but uh, maybe they're not being invited to the meetings. Thanks, Bob. A hefty question. I'd expect nothing less. Catherine. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights was ratified by all nations of the world, so I, I think that it, it clearly does reflect values um, at a given moment in human history. Uh, but there is uh, a character and a quality to them which uh, I think sets them apart from the sort of generic question of belief. Uh, and for that reason, I think it does amount to a common currency in the same way that the Millennium Development Goals, for example, of, uh, for, for example, having all children finishing primary school and so forth are are goals that I think we can stand behind. That doesn't mean that human rights are not complicated. I mean, one of the complexities on human rights, for example, that um, there's quite a controversy around issues on children's rights, which I'm sure Ken knows about, because um, some people uh, have really pushed children's rights to a point that parents and teachers feel that it's uh, eroding their authority. Mm -hmm. And there are all kinds of debates around when and under what circumstances child labor uh, should be ended abruptly and so forth. So 
uh, I guess I question the, this, the, the implication that I read into your question that these are somehow um, similar in, in character to the kind of, of beliefs that a religious organization might proselytize. On the, um, let me make very clear on the corruption issue, my mission is to br bridge this gulf mm -hmm. uh, between religious and secular actors on issues where I think there is enormous common concern. That's what I've done for the last 15 years. Uh, and in order to do that, you clearly have to try to understand what the concerns are on both sides. Uh, on the corruption issue, it is a bit of a puzzle. And we have written and thought about that. Um, my general conclusion is, first of all, the sort of anti-corruption TI, Transparency International Movement, is quite Northern European and therefore is particularly uneasy uh, in engaging with a wide range of religious actors. I think, secondly, a lot of religious organizations really have not dealt with the latest thinking on combating corruption. Uh, and some of them... Uh, are still in the process with accountability and so forth internally mm -hmm. uh, of coming to terms with, with their own houses and therefore of, of what it is that they'd recommend. But given how important it is as a root cause, something that evokes such passion and such a reaction in the countries that we're most concerned about, um, the weak governance issues, I think that there's an enormous area of potential engagement so the, the, the reason, I guess what I'm trying to as well uh, figure this figure out is the reason these religious groups, you said, were, are absent from these discussions, and to, to ask Bob to, to say what Bob said was, is it because they just have absented themselves, or is there some sort of regulation or someone controlling their attendance at these? No, I don't think so. And the, the next, well, just to give you, the, there's a huge international anti-corruption conference. It was supposed to take place in Tunis um, last October, uh, and it had to be canceled because of the election. It will now take place in Malaysia mm -hmm. uh, in September, early September, and there have been invitations for panels and proposals. I'm on the advisory group for that. And so I'm having a series of discussions of, of who might attend and how, uh, how one might tr have a stronger voice. Uh, it's been difficult on both sides. So I don't think it's, there's no rule. It's one of these sort of things you have to try to understand and diagnose. But it's, uh, these are chapter organizations. In other words, a lot of the decision making is made in each country where the dynamics of who is fighting corruption and how they understand the origins of, of corruption, et cetera, differ. Uh, and so I think there is, between now and September, a lot of scope Absolutely. Uh, for uh, bringing these voices more prominently. And, and I would say something similar on gender, except that on gender, uh, there's a wider gap, I think, a more conscious gap between what are perceived as feminists mm -hmm. and well, religious organizations and religious men, but also religious women. Mm -hmm. And that is more pronounced in the United States and Europe than it is in many other parts of the world, but it's not insignificant, and it is uh, something that I think we can and need to work on so that there is more engagement and more appreciation of what's happening on both sides. Could Kent and uh, Ashoka would like to chip in? Or? Just, just to point out that... Um, Look, Christian NGOs are no different than national governments in many respects in the sense that they have to work in a particular context. And in a lot of the places we work, uh, the political situation is not very favorable to what most of us would consider transparent or democratic or, or good. And you're always walking a fine line of when do you push so hard that you get thrown out of the country and you get to stop feeding children and you you don't have you can't help them in health, et cetera. So, a lot of folks want to do what they can do, but they're also very conscious that they can't do anything if they get so crossways with the government that they're going to be thrown out. So that's not just unique to Christian NGOs. All NGOs face it, secular and governments face it as well. But here again is a, a place where I think the faith-based organizations have a, a particular role to play that is uh, an unusual opportunity. Uh, we're a community-based organization. 
most of the healthcare, much of the healthcare in Africa is delivered by faith-based organizations. We have the best networks on the ground. A lot of the change that has to occur has to uh, happen at the grassroots level, uh, having as many people as possible beginning to do the right thing. In fact, converting people from selfishness to being concerned about uh, the common good. Anytime you cooperate with the church and that kind of change in a person's life occur, it has a positive effect on community. I'll give you one example. I was just back from DRC a week ago on the road from Kinshasa uh, to the airport in DRC. We saw all of these, these uh, vans absolutely packed with humanity, with people hanging out the back and the front. You've seen these things before. And the person I was with from World Vision said, these are called spirits of death because 80% of all the casualties are these, these terribly overpacked vans. Well, a Christian, um, a very serious evangelical Christian, as a matter of fact, was elected or became the minister of transport. And he felt an obligation to not be corrupt and to do something different. And he had a whole fleet of many vans and many buses produced that were safe and that could transport people well. And you know what he put on the side of the, the, the buses? Spirit of life. Mm. Anytime a person becomes infected uh, with the love of God, a sense of an obligation to the community, they'll have a positive impact on their community. So if faith-based uh, organizations help inspire that even by example, by their own example, uh, that uh, is sometimes uh, a positive step that can make a difference. The importance of belief. Ashoka, do you like to? Well, just, I mean, it's so many uh, different and complex questions. Welcome but to the RSP <laughs> uh, event. <laughs> yes. Um, I would say that, you know, some of the um, critiques that are available in terms of um, how the continuation of poverty and inequality provide the ground for proselytization uh, need uh, greater examination. Because ideally, basic things like health care and food should not have to come from the outside. Mm -hmm. I mean, we live in a world of such incredible inequality that even the basic food and the vaccination shot has to be provided from an a, a organization that comes from the outside when it doesn't have to be the case, but this is the reality of our world. Mm -hmm. But if we are really sort of asking these questions about change, then we have to conceptualize a world where there is a, a self-sufficiency, mm -hmm. uh, where communities can provide those basic services for themselves, which means a sort of a reorganizing of the way the world operates mm -hmm. in terms of greater equality and uh, not having a handful of, say, transnational corporations control so much of the resources uh, and the power in the world. So it is in that kind of context where um, local communities have greater control over their lives when they can make informed choices about conversion or accepting a religion in greater freedom. So I'm just sort of throwing that out as the, the larger uh, question for which there are no easy answers. No, there certainly are not. And I see Tom Pritchard clutching the mic for the last 10 minutes. So mm -hmm. Tom, introduce yourself. And yes, I'm Tom Pritchard. I'm with an effort um, that Becky is associated with called Sudan Sunrise. And one area that I would love to have the panel's reflections on is not faith-based organizations, but faith-friendly organizations. Um, one initiative of, uh, that we've been engaged in uh, after some uh, burning of churches in a uh, couple churches in Khartoum, um, there were young Sudanese Muslims who said, we need help because we want to help rebuild a church to show that we stand for freedom of religion. And we want to do this in South Sudan as an expression of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. The um, Darfurian Muslim man who led the effort was actually tortured and almost put to death for this. But interestingly, the brick wall that we ran into was finally on the Christian side. 
um, where that the few hundred young Muslims who wanted to do this, their effort was, was not received. Now, they were able, we did do such things as take aid, help them take aid to victims of, of, of the government's attack on Abyei. So they were taking aid to non-Muslims who'd suffered at the hands of the government in the north. And we've engaged in the opposite side of helping uh, South Sudanese Christians take aid to Darfurian Muslims. But I'd like your thoughts and reflections on the niche of, of faith-friendly organizations where um, religion is not pushed aside, is, it's treated with respect, um, but where people of any religious value are welcome. Would you like to say that? Let me use this great question to introduce two ideas that we haven't talked about very much. One that is, um, has a lot of appeal uh, is interfaith activity. And it does involve sometimes very practical uh, cooperation between different people from different faiths. Uh, and sometimes, obviously, it involves a much more intellectual dialogue. But there is a sense that if people do work together and get to know each other, mm -hmm. uh, that first of all, they'll be able to know who to contact in times of trouble, but that also that in general, social cohesion within a society will develop. And it's also, for some governments, uh, much easier to look to an interfaith organization than to be open to another twist in all this, which is the sense of favoritism. Now, there are a lot of very small anecdotal, uh, not small, but there are a lot of anecdotal cases of interfaith activity. One of my favorites is in Ghana, the Interfaith Garbage Initiative, where there was um, an effort of the religious leaders to clean up the city. Um, and I think they hoped, and this is another issue we haven't really focused on very much, is they were hoping to get some financing from the World Bank, which was a non-starter, because garbage collection is probably not the main mandate. But when the election came and there was tension, the group of religious leaders who had been involved in this knew each other, and they were able to play a significant role in heading off tensions during the election. So I think it's, uh, the, the interfaith dimension uh, is clearly important. The second one um, is a bit related. You're saying faith-friendly. Um, what I, and, and I guess the implication is that people from outside should be supportive, whether that's in moral terms and speaking out or even supporting such efforts financially. Uh, one of the things that we're looking for and arguing for passionately is religious literacy. Mm -hmm. In other words, so that people in the development world, the foundation world, the business world, have enough acquaintance with the uh, religious uh, landscape that they can make smart decisions about w where the right person to talk to is and whether something like this is significant or whether it's a loopy idea, which, which are, does happen. So I think that this question of faith literacy is very important, but so is development literacy. The number of misunderstandings of what development organizations do is, is extraordinary, and there's also a huge time lag. A lot of the comments I hear about uh, organizations are really 20 to 30 years out of date. Uh, so if there's some way that we can bring these worlds closer together because they share so many of the same concerns. I think that's, that's what we're trying to do. We have another question. Oh, Kent, would you like to respond? Or if there's I've asked myself the question, why is it that World Vision has been able to function in hostile situations? And we function in some areas that are Christian and areas that are non-Christian or Muslim. And a quarter of our work is in Muslim areas. And do you know that our most protection comes from, in the Muslim communities, comes from the, the Muslims themselves? And it's because of the method we use. I mean, we go into a community, we meet the imams, we explain that we're there, what we're doing. We're not trying to keep a tally, we tell them this, we're not trying to keep a, a tally sheet of people who become Christian. We are here to help, we're here to work with them. We are Christian, and often they'll be in a religious dialogue, and that is very often a very positive thing. But we make it very clear that our purpose is to help. 
if we're there for any length of time and they get to find out that that, in fact, is true, I think the, the reputation of Christianity goes up. But then when radicals show up on the scene, guess who comes to our assistance? It's the people who know us who are of the other religion and say, no, that's not, don't, don't hurt them. They're helping us. They're working with us. So it all has to do with the way you engage a community that then is other uh, than you are. And one example is a few years ago, we had right after 9-11, uh, I think it was Mauritania. Was that, I think it was Mauritania, is that Mauritania, Adam? I can't remember it, but our national director was shot at and his daughter was hit by a, a machinist. And uh, she survived and insisted that we not leave the country. And when we showed back up in the country, it was the leaders of the country, the Muslim country, an Islamic state, who met World Vision at the Tarmac because they'd been so touched by us being willing to come back after experience extremist violence. Now, I think that communicated more about who we are than any tract we could have handed out or anything else we could have done. It improved the relationship. We still got to do our work. Obviously, for us and for many other uh, religious NGOs, um, we will do the work whether or not anybody ever um, changes their faith. The, the work is important enough. It deserves to be done just because the need is there. And you can take that position and uh, not be compromising who you are as a Christian. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, you'll probably, you, you, the status of who you are will probably go up. But we don't keep track. It would be the worst return on investment in development history if you looked at our converts relative to where we do our work. Yeah. But that's not the point. That's not why we do it. And, and yet I think we're a seriously Christian organization. Um, I just think Ashoka will yeah, give a very brief comment. And then uh, who I think it was uh, Chuck, if you don't mind, I think it was the lady in front of you who had a hand up first. I want to be fair. Yeah, in terms of the difference between faith-friendly and proselytizing organizations, uh, I think there's plenty of examples, say, from Sri Lanka, just from among the uh, Christian organizations. Now, in Sri Lanka, which is a multi-religious uh, society, uh, the Buddhists, the Hindus, the Muslims, and the Christians have been living together in relative harmony for you know centuries. But it is with the influx of uh, proselytizing organizations uh, that uh, new forms of conflicts have emerged. And many Christian, including Catholic organizations, have worked in the Sri Lankan context um, without being charged of um, unethical conversions or anything like that. Um, but with the influx of the new Christian evangelical organization, particularly from the United States, local communities have sort of conflated the two, and it's all Christian organizations, including some of the, say, traditional uh, pre-existing Catholic organizations, are being charged with uh, unethical conversions and proselytism. So I think that distinction is important, mm -hmm. uh, even within a particular uh, religious uh, 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 community. Mm. I just want to, I mean, this is a very good point you make. I mean, this is one of the questions we wanted to raise to when, we, when we were having our, the formal discussion was that there are actually different, different religious organizations do things differently. I mean, the, the, the Roman Catholic organizations do, these, do things differently, like Mother Teresa was, men was mentioned earlier. She said, I do the work, I leave the, the conversion, say, to the bishops. Uh, other Christian traditions, they all vary in, in, in the way they, mm -hmm. they do their work. And, uh, and this is, of course, a tension because the, all these different types of organizations operate in these various contexts. So, um, you know, some people mix social work and religious work. Other people keep it very separate. And uh, so, I mean, I, I'll come to your question, but this is, this is an issue that we need to be aware of. There are different ways of doing things, uh, different organizations do things differently. Hi, yes, uh, Kathy Grossman, I'm with Religion News Service. Um, I'm fascinated that at no point have I heard a specific mention of overpopulation or family planning 
as one of the major issues in development countries, and these are, of course, highly value-loaded issues. So where I come to my question is, when a religiously motivated organization, whether it's a Jewish group motivated by tikkun olam to heal the world, or by the fifth pillar of one of the pillars of Islam to do charity, or whether it's love of Jesus, nonetheless, the the choice of priorities of where they give them the aid and where they put their human bodies to help people is made on the home base here in you know largely American turf, Western turf, uh, by Western value systems. Where is the issue about the priorities being set by the country that's being helped, the, by the developing nation? What if their priority is family planning or girls' education or something which doesn't match, doesn't coordinate with the values of the particular faith-based organization? Mm -hmm. What happens, do you only put your money and your human capital where your values are in accord and it doesn't matter what the developing country says, well, that's priority number four. Priority number one is actually not that. I'm, I'm, this is an excellent question, and I'm also getting uh, signals like this and that from various folks <laughs> at the RFP. So very quickly, if I could ask you, excellent panel, to answer this question about what, what, are the, what about the, the recipient country's priorities? Do, don't they matter? One of the great mantras of the development business these days is country ownership. Mm -hmm. And there are all kinds of mechanisms now. There is an appreciation that outside ideas will not work, uh, and they're, they're unethical. Um, that does sometimes come in tension with international um, uh, wisdom. And, and let me give you two examples, family planning is clearly one of them. Uh, and I wish that a lot of the passion for family planning did come from some of the countries with the highest birth rates. Uh, but that, that's, we've, that's not the case. And they, there are some exceptions. But uh, so we, we've done a big review of how different religious groups look at family planning. And they're more positive than the, than the image uh, that, that is conveyed. And we're actually working in Senegal with some of the senior Muslim religious leaders to try to engage them more actively uh, in child spacing and family planning. Uh, but it's a new notion uh, for many of them. So, so it's, that's, uh, that's a complicated issue. But this, this question of country ownership, there are a whole slew of mechanisms to try to have consultations and country strategies and country diagnostics and, and so forth. But, but it does come back to some of the questions we've been focusing on here, that it is about both respect and dialogue. Mm -hmm. So it, it, you, that respect and does not mean that you just support whatever somebody says they want. Uh, and it does, of course, raise all the questions of who's representative uh, and uh, what really is the voice of the people. Are women's voices, for example, really being heard? in some of the ways that, that priorities are, are presented. Uh, but I, if the one comment that I can make is that this is clearly something that has penetrated into a very wide variety of organizations that work in this field. Very briefly, Ken, do you have anything to add? Uh, not too much. I think Catherine really hit it very well. Country okay. ownership is, of course, I don't know who's going to make an argument against that. So. Yeah. Uh, but I would say this, and we're back to the insight that Dr. Woodbury said earlier in the first session, and that is it doesn't matter if you're uh, Christian, Muslim, or secular, or a government. You come with a point of view. You can inappropriately use that point of view, or, or you, you don't have to. Plenty of examples of secular NGOs and the U.S. government going into situations being very clumsy culturally, and not paying any attention to the religious values of the organization and making the aid practically conditional on them making, putting in charge the kind of people who have values much like more that you would find in New York City or Washington, D.C. It's not very culturally sensitive. It's a challenge we all have to face uh, is to do this right. And the second point is simply the, the importance of what I call the big tent. Um, the point is not for the Catholics uh, to agree with the evangelicals, to agree with the secular folks on family planning. 
The question is, is there a way that you can take those disparate groups and find a way to advance the, the well-being of women and children and mothers? And you can. There are certain things Catholics can't do, but there are other things they can do that are very, very positive. Other things that uh, Protestants might do and other things that others might do. But they can all be part of a big tent that agrees that they want to move forward, each doing what they can do in good conscience. And this idea that it's one size fits all, that we exclude from the tent people we happen to not completely agree with, is antithetical to pluralism and it's antithetical to, to good uh, development. Very quickly, um, I've written a whole book on uh, population from a gender perspective, so I won't get into that here, and I hope you'll look at it. But in terms of the other issue, I think that the forces of globalization are so dominant that local countries have a much harder time to bring alternative uh, paths of evolution or even protect their own traditions and cultures. Um, I mean, the fact is that one, we have one global economic system, and there is no choice uh, whether one works within that uh, or not, because it's a given. Uh, so the globalizing force, forces, including the transnational corporations, the international organizations, and including the faith-based organizations, have an overwhelming influence. And that is felt differently in different societies. In a country like uh, India, which is much bigger, or in an authoritarian state, there may be you know, more efforts to withstand some of the globalizing forces. But in smaller countries like, say, Sri Lanka and so on, there may not be as uh, much room uh, because uh, they cannot withstand the force, uh, uh, the converging forces of uh, uh, global political and economic uh, organizations and cultural ones as well. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Catherine Marshall, Kentil, and Asoka Bandarage for for this excellent conversation. Uh, I've learned a great deal, and I'm sure people here have learned a lot. And thank you for, for being brave enough to step in to talk about proselytism and development. Thank you to the audience for their questions. As with any, as with any RFP event, the conversation continues. In, uh, in a while, a few days, uh, the wonderful staff at the RFP will put this conversation on the internet. And I urge you to, to go on the RFP website, it's an excellent one, and read this, as well as read the blogs.